and welcome to the Santa Ponce Community Church online service. It is a great privilege to be able to spend time together in the Word of God and that for whatever reasons, uh, whether you live far away or whether you live close and you are a person of risk, that we're able to connect at least online. And today we're going to be looking at uh, the word understanding. We are trying to define um, a lowest common denominator of culture among us. We looked at being flexible as a, as a church. We looked at being open towards one another as a church. We looked at the need to be able to cooperate together as a church, as well as today we're gonna to look at our need for understanding for one another, towards the circumstances, uh, uh, just realizing, understanding that we have an enemy against us, understanding that sometimes the outcome is not just what we thought it would be, but it doesn't mean that there is failure involved, but rather that God is able to work through those things in our life to accomplish His purpose. So our prayer is that you will be encouraged today as we study through the scriptures and we are drawing this culture out of it, which is one uh, distinctive of understanding. Hey there guys, um, welcome and uh, just got a few announcements for those of you that have been tuning into our online service. Um, we are so encouraged to see that so many people have been tuning in and watching from all over the world. We've had people from Zimbabwe, from the UK, from the US, from Germany, from Spain, and for us um, as a church, it's a real encouragement. Um, I want to fill you in on a few things that you can do if you're watching our service online. Um, we want you to be interactive. So what that means is there's a chat um, panel on the side. Speak to people on that, encourage people on that, encourage us on that. Um, if you need prayer, there's a little prayer button and you're more than welcome to pray with us. Um, you press the button and it will put you through to someone um, that will pray or speak to you, um, however you, however you're feeling. Um, if you're living on the island um, and you can't quite make it to church at the moment um, because we don't have the kids ministry, we're hoping to have that soon. Um, so keep on tuning in online and we will keep you posted here um, and on our YouTube channel. Um, what you can do is come to our Friday morning devotions every Friday at 9.30 a.m. here at church. And we also have prayer and worship on a Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. at church. If you can come, 
come. Um, you don't have to bring the kids, you can come as you are and possibly watch the service online on a Sunday if that's you. Um, we hope to get the church up and running for families as soon as possible. Uh, one more thing that I'd, I'd like to announce is we have on the SBCC online website at the moment um, a little movie called A Rush of Hope by Greg Laurie. I would just recommend that you tune in and watch that. So let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, I had a little Bible here. Oh, here it is. So, and let's read together um, from verse 7, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And that the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church in which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, for the great privilege of being in it. I pray, Father, that you will um, speak to our hearts, that you will continue to guide us as a church and in, in, in where we are heading and, and how we are heading there. Not only where we're going, but how we're going. And I pray, Father, that you will take this time and just speak to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. So we've been talking lately about where it is that we are going as a church. I felt, like I said last week, in the last couple of weeks, and in coming back, you almost felt like the Lord is doing something new. You almost felt like there's a severe pruning going on, and pruning never looks fun. I have two lemon trees, and, um, Three, yeah. No, I had three. I have two now. And, uh, but I only have, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that I pruned one of them only maybe twice and only a little bit because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of pruning it because when you're done with it, you're afraid that you're not going to get any more fruit. You know, you just cut it back and it's just at a bare minimum. But I have another lemon tree that was not bearing any lemons. And finally I took it and I severely pruned it and, and I actually replanted it somewhere else. And all of a sudden it just began to make lemons and big lemons and juicy lemons. And, and sometimes we are afraid of pruning because it's, it's sort of going backwards. But it's when you prune that actually the juices begin to flow with more strength and they begin to push their way out and they actually bear more fruit. And, and I feel like that is what's going on here. And in and, 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 and having this pruning going on, I also felt it's like, okay, so where are we heading? What are we doing? And, and I sat down with Michael and, and we talked about... Um, you know, he's got an amazing gift of, of just drawing out what's inside and organize it. I, my mind, I think my mind looks like uh, a bunch of different cables that are all together and you don't know which cable is what and you have to unravel them. 
you know, but, but it's, it's just amazing when you sit with somebody and they're able to take your thoughts and organize them a bit. And, and that's what we've been doing. And, and bottom line, with what we've um, come up with, or what, what I feel like we've been doing all along, but now it's actually articulated, is we want to encourage people when they come to church to stand on the balance foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and all those words are pregnant with meaning, but standing in a time where everything is shifting. Jesus spoke about standing. You can either build on the solid rock or you can build on the sand. And we really need to be able to stand on something that actually holds your weight. And balance because the world is becoming more and more polarized. I mean, you, you only, I mean, the one place that I think is the clearest at the moment is the United States. It's unbelievable. Just the, the polarization of views and opinions and whether it's in Christianity, whether it's in politics, whether it's in even health, whether it's in finances, everything is just becoming polarized. And, and I think there's a cry there should be a cry in our hearts for a sense of balance. And you're never going to find more balance, more beautiful balance, than in the gospel of Jesus. You know, when you, when you go out through the world, and you, you, you might have someone who has a sense of justice, and they're very just, but they have no mercy. You might have people that are very merciful and just become enablers, and there's no sense of justice. You have people that might be super, super loving, and they become fluff. And then you got people that have a strong back and they become completely haters. And it's in the gospel of Jesus that we actually see where mercy and justice kiss, as the Proverbs say. You know, where, where you see, uh, you see uh, the perfect holiness and the justice and the righteousness of God being fulfilled at the cross, and yet through the love of God by Jesus going to the cross. And you see wonderful balance, and that true balance is gonna be found in Jesus Christ, and that is our aim. Our aim is to encourage you that way. There's no more beautiful life on earth than a whole Christian, than a Christian that is growing healthy with Jesus. And as we looked at last week, when we were talking about oh, Pear and I and a couple others praying, and I was like, oh Lord, just take these videos and just show, just so people will be able to say that we Christians are not weird. And then Pear gets up, is like, no, we don't care if they think we're weird. We just want you to, we just want them to see that you, Jesus, are not weird. And that Jesus is the least weird person in the universe. He is the most normal person, the most extraordinary person at the same time in the universe. And, and, and that is what we want to be able to come across, is to show you Jesus, to be able to encourage you to know him, and to stand with him. And we, we have three, three things that, three, three sort of side-by-side -side missions that we want to do. One is to introduce people to Jesus. The other one is that people will grow in Jesus. And the third is that people will be equipped to serve Jesus. Those are the greatest things that you could ever do with your life. To meet him, to grow, and you and you find yourself when you grow as a Christian is different than growing in any other area of life, because when you grow in any other area of life, you're either being indoctrinated or you're being um, sort of self-developing. But with Jesus, what you see is a transformation that happens. You find yourselves as the you find yourself as the subject, something. You are a miracle to yourself. You're like, how in the world did I change? It's no longer you do it. It's, it's Jesus looks at, at Peter and says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. I will make you. You find yourself in the wonderful miracle of growing as a Christian and there's no better feeling in the universe than feeling the sense of purpose, not just an earthly purpose, but to realize that you're actually serving he who created everything, that you're actually involved in serving and accomplishing 
things that are not just merely temporal, but are eternal. The sense of purpose that Jesus gives to our life. And we felt that we needed, uh, uh, we know the Bibles are our guide, but we felt uh, like we needed a culture, a church culture. And this was developed more for the team. But we wanted to have something that would, um, th that we would say, okay, what is it that we already um, are or feel like we need to be growing into that we feel like need to be core values in our, in our life? Uh, sort of distinctives that allow us to grow. And uh, we came up with seven things, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we tackled two the first Sunday, one last Sunday, which was flexible, open, cooperative, understanding, solution-oriented, enthusiastic, and dependable, which, which uh, with the, uh, made the acronym FOCUSED. And today, I would like to tackle the U of focus, which is understanding. And depending how we're doing for time, we might uh, go to solution-oriented. But we looked at the culture, it's very important. You know, what we are, who we are as, as, a, as a people. Remember that sometimes things are socially accepted that are wrong. We talked about last week how Don Richardson went to um, um, uh, some natives on an island and as he was sharing the gospel with them, as he was reading through the gospel, he came to the point where Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And the whole tribe began to cheer. They began to, they, they thought, they thought it was the greatest thing in the world. You see, in their culture, betrayal and how, tr and how cleverly you could betray someone was actually the most esteemed thing in that culture. Isn't that amazing? And then so he had to sort of retrain their thinking. It's like, no, betrayal is not good. What Jesus did is good. And they saw Jesus as a loser. And it's very important that in our church life, in our culture, that we have things that we hold dear. And one is to be flexible. If we are going to, in this church, live happily together, we're all going to have to be a little bit flexible, aren't we? I mean, I think these masks are a, a, the epitome of having to be flexible. My goodness, I don't like them at all. And... You know, we, we have to go with the flow to a degree. But you know, some of you guys come from different backgrounds, you come from different types of churches, from different, you have different viewpoints on things, and we have to learn how to be flexible towards one another. Pastor Chuck always said, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. In marriage, we need flexibility one with the other. The moment two people become rigid, or one person becomes rigid, either one bends completely over, or it just doesn't work anymore. And, you know, it is when people are flexible towards one another that, that, that harmony comes open. We, we have to be open to, to speak what's on our hearts and speak of our ideas and speak about our dreams and speak if we've been offended. We have to be open people. And yet we have to be open not only to this shit, but we have to be open to receive it, right? I kind of like being open to share it. And then somebody says something to me, you know, I don't like what you said. And that my face doesn't show it initially. Maybe my lip trembles a little bit, you know? But inside, inside, it's just like this pride lifts up. And it's, it is so important that we, we are not defensive automatically, but that there's an openness if someone says to, to you, hey, could I speak to you about something? That automatically we're not going into automatic defense, but to be able to hear the person out and say, oh, okay, yeah, great. And I'm open to any ideas you've got. And then to be able to be open to consider it and then to be open to agree or disagree with it. 
and the other person to be able to receive your openness to agree or disagree with it. You know, but openness, cooperation, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, the, the ability of working together as different parts, each unique. And we looked at university. University means unity in diversity. And really, nowadays, what's happening is everyone's wanting to make us into cookie cutters to get along. Or rather, cookies from a cookie cutter. But, you know, we, we should not be the same. The beautiful thing is when we can be our individual selves, the beautiful personalities that God has given us, and yet we're able to cooperate with one another, even if at times we invade each other's territory. This morning we had a, a, a little bit of with the camera, with the audiovisual and the seating. It's two different things that are going on and, and we're bumping into each other's areas. But at the same time, the cooperation comes when we are able to see each other and, and realize that we're all working for one purpose. And you know, I mean, my heart invades other parts of my body, doesn't it? I mean, if you, if you go here, you can feel it. And I'm sure it hits against other organs and the, or the other organs are not like, hey, heart, could you please stop? You're bothering me. <laughs> no, no, if I stop, you all stop. <laughs> you know, so every part of the body works cooperatively. You know, when, you, when it doesn't cooperate is what I call hiccups. You know, this is like, doesn't, you, you be, <laughs> I have this thing with Jonathan, whenever he gets the hiccups, I scare him, you know, I tell him like, you know what, Jonathan, I've been thinking about it. I don't want you to watch another movie again. And he's like, you're kidding. I'm like, no, I, they're really bad. And, and I've been thinking about it for several months. And, and, and uh, no, no more movies. And then there's a quietness. And then I'll say, Jonathan, are your hiccups gone? <laughs> and he goes, they are. <laughs> you know? And it's just like, and all of a sudden, the body begins to cooperate again. But hiccups really, ultimately, is the body no longer cooperating or trying to get back into rhythm. And, uh, and today I want to look at understanding. And you're like, why in the world did you read that verse? What, when are we going to talk about the verse? And we're actually going to talk about the verse at the end. But if we are going to function in any sphere of life, but obviously, specifically, I'm talking about here in the church, but in any sphere of life, there's going to have to be an element of understanding in our life. The ability to comprehend but not only the ability to comprehend, uh, understanding actually means also to sympathize with somebody. So you comprehend, you sympathize, and also it carries an element of, of patience with it. But we are to gonna we are gonna need to have understanding with people with other people. No man is an island. We, we don't stand alone. And, and we are, it, it, there's no such thing as Christianity by yourself. Christianity by yourself that, that doesn't work with other Christians is not really Christianity at all. And it carries the patience with it. So it means bearing pains or trials calmly and without complaints. So it's going through difficulties without complaining, manifesting forbearance under provocation, that's patience, not hasty, steadfast. And we are to be understanding and patient with people. Romans 15.1 says, we then who are strong are to bear with the scruples of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, for even Christ did not please himself. But here the scenario that Paul is painting is you have um, a, a someone who, who is... Um, 
who there's a sense of weakness in the mind, who, who is sensitive to certain things, maybe is prone to anxiety, maybe is prone to certain difficulties in life. And the, and the problem comes when someone who might be mentally stronger to all of a sudden look down and despise and reject that person who is weaker. And Paul is saying, listen, let those who are strong, you ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not please ourselves, but let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification for even Christ and not please himself. In this context is also the eating of meat. You know, and sometimes we, we might see someone who's tense towards anxiety or tense towards maybe not eating certain foods because of their conscience being pierced. And, 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 and we who are strong are to assist and help that person and not necessarily sort of rub it in their face how weak they are. We are to encourage and love. I think... Um, Stefano has, he's got his son Jacobo, and, it's, and, and I, I think this illustrates it a little bit, but um, S Stefano is, a, is just a great dad. I mean, he just loves his son, and, and, and Jacobo, he became, is like, man, I'm not, I'm not eating anymore. I'm, he became vegan because of animal rights, and, 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 and so, you know, and we would have conversations with him. Nothing wrong with veganism. I, I, Please understand, I think that the, the problem sometimes with any of these things is that we don't become captive and guilt-driven by other people, you know? So we have to be uh, quite settled in our mind why it is that we're doing it and that we're not becoming slaves of our conscience, you know? And, um, but anyway, so his son became uh, a vegan and a man. Uh, Stefano would cook with, well, actually, uh, uh, Jacobo would cook, but he just went with the flow. He didn't really argue with it. And then uh, all of a sudden he's like, well, I don't know if I, he realized his bl blood was a bit lower, his blood counts were, were not doing good. So he says, man, I got to eat a little bit. So he began to eat a little bit. But Stefano, as a, as a father that loves his son, went through that journey with his son. I tend exactly to the opposite. I tend exactly to the opposite. I don't know how Stefano did it. I would be like, get over it. No, you're eating meat right now. <laughs> you know, just like, I mean, I tend towards the opposite of that. And, and, and we have to be very careful. And now Stefano, I mean, Jacob actually goes, he, he won't eat anything that he doesn't grow himself or he doesn't catch himself. Like he goes spearfishing and he'll just catch his own fish. But it's a journey that he's been on. And you know what? When people come to this church, when people come to this church, they're on journeys. And if we feel in any way we are stronger than other people, it's not so we rub it in people's face, but so we help them to grow in Jesus. To, to come like Stefano alongside Jacobo and just be part of that journey. Man, I tell you, Dave Shirley, when I was in London, I, I went through, really, when I talk about wanting balance, it's because I've done every extreme. And it's just like, okay, I'm gonna fast and I'm gonna fast these many days. And you know what Dave would do to me, who's, who's a, he, he's just such a great guy. He would just go, okay, I'll fast with you. And he just came on the journey with me on all these things of, 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 of my, of, of the spiritual journey that I was on. He wasn't there saying, oh, well, you should do this or you should do that. He, never, he actually came along with me and was able to mold me along the ride as opposed to a frontal attack. Now, in Ephesians 4, 2, it says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Guys, you all have very different personalities in this church. I love this church because you guys are all strong-minded, uh, strong-willed. I mean, this is the furthest thing from a cult this church, because I've never seen a church with so many people 
with so such strong views, which I, I think it's great, as long as it is with lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Again, have your own mind, but we bear with one another. And you know, if people get on your nerves, and you're like, man, I have to bear with so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so has that view, and I gotta bear with this, and I gotta bear with that person, and I gotta bear with Andrew, and I gotta bear with um, Brenda, and I gotta bear with James, and his idiosyncrasies, <clears throat> and his hello, 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 can he please quit doing that? You know, and I gotta bear with this. You know what, people have to bear with you. <laughs> no? I mean, I think, sometimes I get it, it's like, I think I'm bearing with all these people, and then somebody asked me the question, it's like, well, do you think that there's some things in your life you might have to change? I was like, no. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> I'm the best husband, pastor, father, well, father, I don't know, but, but uh, I, in the world. I'm so pleasant to be with. And then somebody goes, yeah, you are a little bit intense sometimes. Me? <laughs> but it's the same thing with you. We're sometimes we're oblivious to how people have to bear with us. And in this church, we have to have in our minds very clear that with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And notice in Colossians 3.13, it says, Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. And then in 1 Peter 3.7, it says, You know, uh, dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife, being heirs, knowing that you are heirs together in the grace of life. Dwelling with understanding. We are to dwell with understanding. You know, sometimes people might be really messed up in this church, but you don't know where they come from. Sometimes people might be rude to you one particular Sunday, but you don't know what's going on all week. And there's a sense that we need to have understanding to grasp all this. Now, though, there's another side of the coin. Because we can all of a sudden say, see, you gotta dwell with understanding with me. You gotta dwell with understanding with me. You gotta dwell with understanding with me. And then we begin to demand that from other people rather than practice it. And in Galatians 6, 2 through 5, it says, bear one another's burdens. So we are to sympathize with one another, right? We are to, to carry each other. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For in anyone, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Listen to this. For each one shall bear his own load. Did you get that? It starts with bear one another's burdens, but then it says, hey, but be careful. Each one has to carry his own burden. You know, and sometimes we do come across, and I can do that and you can do that, people who are like, I'm not getting any support. I'm not getting any help. But the question is, it's not anybody's obligation to carry your burden. You are to carry your own burden. And as you're carrying your, your own burden, people come along and help you. But it's very important that we do that. It's Jonathan doing homework. I don't understand them. Can you help me? Well, you do it. And I'll help you. No, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. Because what you want is you want me to do it for you. And then we sit down and then you do pro, uh, pro, uh, problem one, problem two. 
And, and, and then he's like, okay, help me some more. And the next thing you know, you've done all of it. And it's amazing. We, by nature, are manipulative. Our hearts are manipulative. And this is where we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves and say, you know what? I want to fight this fight myself. I want to grow myself, but I need the body to support me. Now, understanding not just with people, we need understanding, particularly when it comes to serving the Lord in a team, in the ministry, in a church, in a work of God. One of the things that we need to have is understanding that things don't happen quickly all the time. I think it's a bit of a no-brainer, but it's good to remind ourselves, you know. I never thought I'd be here for 19 years. What's today? The 13th. Two days ago was 19 years that we landed on the island. I gave myself five years at the beginning. And it's been a lot of twists and turns, but if there's one thing that I've learned in 19 years of ministry, and by the way, I'm telling you it's 19 years now, so that when the 20th comes, we'll have a big celebration, huh? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, but, but one thing I've noticed is that things take time. Dusty asked me the other day, Dusty is, uh, many of you, Dusty and Britta were here, and he asked me, why don't you do altar calls? Right, why don't you do invitations to receive the gospel? And I have done sometimes. But why don't I do it every Sunday? Because most of you I see every Sunday. So I feel like if I do an altar call, the one person is going to know that it's for him. You know? But also there's another reason. Although I believe in them, and if we had a church of probably 300 people, it will probably be different. There will be visitors and things like that. So altar calls will probably be more of an opportunity for people. But for you guys that I know week in and week out, I just realized that the journey that you're on with the Lord before you're Christians, while you're becoming a Christian, and after you become a Christian, it takes time. It takes time. To start a school like we're starting right now, the nursery, the building. I mean, I thought... Uh, Hugh told me, upstairs will take two weeks. And downstairs by mid-June, done. Now it's end of October. Now, if I didn't understand that things took time, I'd be strangling Hugh. Things take time. S growth takes time. I just gave advice to one of my friends, uh, you know, Anwar and Nicole. They were here with us at the church. And they, they moved over to Bristol, and they just become, became part of another church. And great friends of ours are there. And I told Anwar, don't rush friendship. Isn't it true? Don't rush friendship. Friendships take time. As you get to know people, as you converse with them, as you're there for one another, as you see how each one has gone through difficulties, as you help each other, as you maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you, 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 you have to confront each other. I don't know, whatever it is. But as you go through all these ups and downs in life, friendships get built. That takes time. And I think if we're going to be here at the church together and we're going to serve together and we're going to see what the Lord does in and through our lives in, um, in the future and if we're going to get along and if we're going to do it with joy, we're going to have to do it with the understanding that whatever happens here is going to take time. Go tell Moses to be in a rush. He was to serve the Lord. He had a call of God upon his life. He had the Spirit of God in, upon his life. He was the chosen one to deliver Israel. And when he went to do it, it wasn't the time. He was thrown into a wilderness to become a shepherd for six months. Nope. For one year. Nope. For four years. Nope. For 40 years. And when the call actually came and said, hey, now is the time, he goes, I don't feel like it now. It's left me. 
It's out of me now. And the Lord goes, no, no, now is the time. And then he goes, in order to deliver the nation of Israel from Egypt to go to the wilderness. I was, Don McQueen was at our house yesterday for dinner and he was in, in Egypt when the coronavirus, when all the lockdowns took a uh, hit. And so they told him, you have a few hours to leave Egypt. And so he rented a car and he went to, uh, he was going to Cairo and, um, and there was roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And then there was one roadblock and they said, you cannot cross by here. If you want, you can go into the desert. And he's like, I don't want to go into the desert. And, and the thought crossed my mind is like, didn't you tell him the children of Israel did and they were here for 40 years. No, I'm not going into the wilderness. But, you know, he went from 40 years of waiting to one climax of being delivered to 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, are we really going to rush God? Paul had the opportunity of his life to share the gospel. And next thing you know, his own people turned against him and he ended up in prison. He probably thought because the Lord appeared to him at night and said, you are going to testify in Rome. He probably thought he was going to Rome within the week. And he ended up in prison for two full years. You cannot read the Bible and come out with the view that God is in a rush to do anything. <clears throat> you just can't do it. As a matter of fact, you're like, why does it take so long? But think about the lives that took a long time and in the middle of that waiting, did not rush things, but actually waited on him. Did you ever see anyone disappointed? Do you ever see anyone in the Bible disappointed by waiting? Which brings me to the next one, which we're going to have to be understanding of our circumstances. Because if waiting for God to do what he's going to do was just a matter of time, but sometimes it's a matter of time in unfavorable circumstances, isn't it? I mean, think about Joseph. He's got the coat of many colors from his dad he's got the dream from God and next thing you know he's sold by his brethren and he spends years as a slave and in, in prison and then finally he goes to Potiphar and he becomes the number two guy he's helping there and he's just thinking to himself oh this is just great finally finally the revelation the, the dream is coming to pass here I am I've come to a place of responsibility and then Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him. And when he says no, she accuses him of attempting to sleep with her. And he gets thrown into prison. And we, if we're going to have to realize in working together, in working in the church of Jesus Christ, that not only are we going to wait, but sometimes we're going to wait in unfavorable circumstances. That's just life. There's not one person in the Bible who served the Lord easy peasy for all of his life. Not one. And then we find ourselves in any trial and we think like, God's forsaken me. No, actually, it's probable. It, he's with you. He's with you. In the midst of the difficulties, he's with you. He was with Ruth when she lost her husband. She was with, he was with Naomi when he lost, she lost her husband and her two children. She was with uh, Elizabeth when she was barren. She was with, um, with David when he was persecuted. He was with Joseph when he was in prison. He was with the nation of Israel when they did what was right in their own eyes. It's just, just biblical to realize that in unfavorable circumstances, do not, th those do not define whether God is for us or against us. Most of the time, if everything's super easy all the time, maybe we're not serving the Lord. And you're like, what? Well, John Wesley, he was on his horse once as he would preach in, in, uh, in the UK. And... Uh, 
he was persecuted all the time. We sing his hymns all the time now, but in the UK, they would throw stones at him. They would, um, I mean, they burned Christians, but, but with him, at one point, he was getting no persecution, and he's like, Lord, have I done something wrong? Then someone threw a rock at him, and he was like, oh, praise the Lord, I'm back in business, you know, just like, but look at 2 Corinthians with me. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, I think it is. In verse 7 of chapter 4, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Listen to what he says. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about the, in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. You see what he's going through? Look at chapter 11 with me. Verse 22 says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I more so. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. For the Jews, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In the weariness and toil. In sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness. Besides the other things which comes upon me daily. My deep concern for all the churches who is weak. And I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and yet I do not burn with indignation. Would you want to go on a mission trip with Paul? Hey, Raph, you want to come? I'm going on a mission trip. I'm going to stay home this time. And yet, the Bible is clear that God was with this guy everywhere he went. The aroma of life, and it's the same with us. The love of God is not seen by our circumstances. The love of God for us is seen at the cross. And we must understand this. We must have understanding of these things. We must understand Isaiah 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Think about it. You go to a gym and you ask a guy to be your coach and train you. If the coach says to you, hey, what would you like to do? Oh, I just like to do 10 push-ups a day. Okay, you're not gonna go very far. It's when you have a Mr. Miyagi that says to you, now wax all these cars. And then he tells you, now paint these walls and I want you to paint them like this. And then you're doing all this stuff and then finally frustrations arise and you go to Mr. Miyagi and says, this sucks. I wanted to learn karate and I'm not learning anything. You're just using me to paint your cars and you're just using me to paint your walls and you're, and you're just using me. You're teaching me nothing. And then he says to him, get over here. And he starts throwing punches. Wax on. Wax off. Paint. And he finds himself that he didn't understand what Mr. Miyagi was doing, but he was learning 
karate. Was it karate? I hope it was karate, because if not, I'm going to look like a real idiot here, you know. But, 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 you know, many times God is like that. He allows us to go through circumstances that are less than favorable. He allows us to go through outcomes that look like defeats. But actually, in his genius, in his multifaceted wisdom, he's actually working out his perfect purposes in our life. He is training us to grow in wisdom, in understanding, in life. And that's what, at the end of the day, that's what we want. We just don't like how it happens. Because we pray, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Lord, grow me in love. Grow me in patience. Do you want to grow in patience when nothing wrong is going on around you? And I'm not speaking down. Yesterday someone asked me, how are you doing, Ralph? And, I'm not, and they could tell I'm down. And I'm like, I'm just not, I think it was Paul that asked me. And I was like, I'm not doing so good. I just had a blowout with Jonathan. We had a day where I think it was six things he did and I kept count of every single one of them. And by the end of the day, I just blew it. Arden is crying. It's like, and Loretta's like, really? That's the way you're gonna win them? And I'm like, I don't care. And then afterwards he came back down and we were able to chat and, and, and we did it well. But man, at the end of the day, I, I'm not speaking down. I'm speaking as a person who still has light years to grow. But this is where we're heading. He's allowing us to go through circumstances. And we will not be, if we yield to the Lord, we will not be the same next year as we are this year or the year after that we are the year we find ourselves in. Next, understanding. There's two more. Understanding that we are in a war. We're going to have to have the understanding that we are in a war. Uh, a Special Forces Sergeant Major in the United States has just been awarded the Medal of Honor. He was key to saving 70 Iraqi prisoners who had, where there was already fresh graves dug up for them to be buried in. They were, it was imminent. Their death was imminent. They were going to be executed. He says, I don't, I don't see myself as a recipient. I see myself as a steward of this medal that not only has been given to me, but others and even some that lost their lives with us. And he says, in that moment, when you land and you begin to take positions, you've trained for this for a week, for two weeks, you've been training the whole scenario, how you would enter, where you would put the ladders, where the bad guys are. And, and, and he says, in that moment where you go in in the dark and you begin to take your first shots at people, you, be, you begin to realize that you're going from being a soldier to being a warrior. And I wonder how many times we see our lives as soldiers, but we just haven't entered into warrior we just like the idea of a spiritual battle but we don't fight the inflamed thoughts the temptations the 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 lies the the spiritual battle that's going on around us we just think it's man against man, and we don't realize that there are spiritual forces. If we read our Bibles, if we just simply take the Bible at face value, even if we take life at face value, we realize that it's not just physical what is going on. There are spiritual battles going on, and, and that we do not just have people that turn against us. We have a devil and Satan who's set on destroying our life. He doesn't like us. He doesn't like unbelievers because he wants to keep them captive. But he doesn't like believers because they can become impactful in this world against his kingdom. 
And sometimes we don't realize we go through life as if life was a playground as opposed to a battleground. My goodness, man. In my mind, it's a battle continuously. You guys ever watched the movie Robin Hood with Kevin Costner? <coughs> She's like, that's my, that describes my life. You know, when the movie begins to, the, the, even the video, is, but you know that arrow, you know, it's like, and, and, and James is like, I know that arrow. You've talked about it a hundred times, but it really is. It's, it's like, uh, you know, Kevin just takes that fiery arrow and he just, and it just comes straight to the, from the screen, straight into you. And that's what my life feels like. A million thoughts a day. Anxious thoughts, hard thoughts, accusative thoughts, uh, just uh, wrong thoughts. You know what I mean? And it's just like, and you know, I mean, I know my thought patterns, but I know other thoughts that are just implanted in. Don't you have them? And the Bible says to take every thought captive. The Bible talks about standing and after I've done all to stand, to stand firm on the evil day. And in this church and in our lives, we're going to have to realize that we are in the midst of a battle. And we sometimes are like, well, why is this happening to me? And I always, I've always thought about a civilian guy walking through the middle of a battlefield and there's the Bullets going from there, there's the bullets going there, there's the, the artillery dropping everywhere, and the guy's going, why are they shooting at me? Because you're in a war. So we ask ourselves, why are, the, why are these things happening to me? Why are these attacks of my mind? Why do I, why do I have these negative thoughts? Why do I, you know, I've, had, I've talked to several people in the last couple of months with extreme suicidal thoughts. Where does that come from to tell someone, just kill yourself? You're worthless. You're not worth anything. The world would be better without you. Where do those thoughts come from? Really, from self? You're going to tell me that comes from self? It's a war we're in. And, and, and we just sort of drop our guard. And then finally, understanding that yes, it's a war, but because we are involved in a great work. Maybe it's just a few people in a school in Ephesus for three years. Paul just had a few people for three years in the school of, at a school of Tyrannus in Ephesus. Maybe it's a conversation with a woman at a well. Maybe it was a food bank like Joseph. Maybe it's just a wall, like Nehemiah. Maybe it's just raising a child, like Elizabeth and Mary. Maybe it's just going to a few women at the river in Macedonia, and God just opened Lydia's heart to understand the things of God, to understand Him. Maybe it's a jailer that's about to kill himself. Maybe it's remaining in a church where there are difficulties, but like Paul told Timothy, I want you to remain and, and, and help with it. Maybe it's writing a letter that you never wanted to write. And after you sent it, you regret writing it, but maybe that letter accomplished the right thing like 2 Corinthians did, and it accomplished a great work. Maybe as an imprisonment for two years in Caesarea that gave the opportunity to Luke to research the Gospel of Luke to be able to be with us for 2,000 years. Oh, when we understand 
that what we are involved in is the greatest adventure, the greatest mission, the greatest purpose in the universe. We are bringing the aroma of the maker of the universe, of the God who loves, of Jesus Christ. We're bringing that message to people whose souls are completely dissatisfied, completely like, like the Rolling Stones say, I can't get no satisfaction every, every, even though I try and I try and I try. Although, like Fleetwood Mac says, tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. Like the cry of, of you know, the police. You don't have to turn on the red light, Roxanne. In a world that is broken, that it is need, in need of health, in need of satisfaction, in need of redemption. It is the greatest mission that we are in. Not the pastor, but you as individuals. And to close with the verse that we started with in Ephesians. If you turn there with me in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 17, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of your calling. You see what, why the word understanding is so important? that the eyes of the understanding of your heart. Isn't that amazing that he, the eyes of the understanding of your heart may be enlightened. That, isn't it amazing that it doesn't say that you may know the wrath, that you may know the anger, that you may know the judgment. Isn't it amazing that it says that you may know the hope? That you may know the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. The hope of his calling, the hope of his riches, the hope of the greatness of his power for us to believe, the hope that raised them above all principality and power, the hope that when not only purpose for life, but when you breathe your last, which you will breathe your last. Today I was talking to uh, uh, Deborah, and she told me she just left her daughter in Madrid. She's going to university and she's like, it's, it's ley de vida, it's the law of life. She's gotta grow up. I wanna call her five times a day, but I can't. I just gonna let her, just wait. James, just wait <laughs> till your little one, you leave her in Madrid. <laughs> but it's, it's law of life. And, and I thought about, you know, it is the law of life. You, let, you gotta let your children fly. You gotta let your children make their own decisions. But it's the law of life, huh? We have to say goodbye. We'll have to breathe our last. You're going to breathe your last. And Jesus Christ came so that we can breathe our last full of hope, full of confidence, full of excitement, full of expectation, realizing that the, though the outward man is perishing, and you know, we get older, we get weaker, our minds get weaker, though, uh, though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. I can't not, I mean, I can wait because I want to see my kids grow. But it is an amazing thing we, had have, we have ahead of us that we will instantly be transformed. Instantly, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible must inherit incorruptibility. I had a conversation the other day with someone. 
We're talking about marriage, life, compatibility and things. And there was a, just a parting of ways. And when you analyze the whole situation, the problem is there was no God. And in this, in our lives, we need that understanding. An understanding that is full of God. In Proverbs 2, 1 through 6, I'm just going to close with reading these. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find not the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant, pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. And this is what we want to do in church here. We want to cultivate one of these attributes of culture that we have understanding with one another, with the timing, with the circumstances, with the outcome, with the fact we're in a battle, with all of these things. If we have that, we're on our, on our, on our good path. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your, the great encouragement that comes from your word. We don't in any way think that we can achieve this understanding on our own. It was King David himself that says, I have more understanding than all my teachers because you yourself teach me. He acknowledged, Lord, that ultimately wisdom and understanding comes from you. And we pray. Like Paul prayed for us that we will be filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of you and the hope of your calling and the knowledge of your will that you would give us a portion of that, Lord. Help us to be people that understand, even if it's understanding that we cannot understand. We love you, Lord. We are so grateful that in the chaos that's going on in the world, we can stand firm. We can stand firm knowing that we belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
So our prayer is that you were spoken to today, that you were, give, you were given equipment, that you would give them given a thought pattern of being able to understand the circumstances that we find ourselves in, even understand the background of people, even be able to understand the great battle that we find ourselves in. As we grow as a church, it is um, of utmost important that we continue to grow from understanding to understanding, realizing that part of it, like we looked at in Proverbs 2, it is an effort. The father says, oh my child, if you would seek for understanding, but also the fact that Paul prays for us that we will be filled with a spirit of wisdom and understanding. So it's both part of a, a striving on our part, a desire on our part, but also an equipping on God's part. And our prayer is that you will grow as the days, weeks, months, and years go by in a deeper understanding of the God who we serve, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and the people that we are dealing with. May God bless you. Capture my heart, I surrender my will. Focus my mind till I'm yielded and still. Hearing your voice to answer your call. Can't speak.